to uh, this uh, class on introduction to biomems and microsystems. So basically if we look at what has been done in the last lecture, uh, we talked uh, last time about different forms of transducers and transduction again is a phenomena wherein there is a change in signal from one form to another. So at length we talked about electrochemical, potentiometric, amperometric, conductometric and so on and so forth uh, type of transducers. We also uh, talked about different optical mass based and thermal mechanisms of transduction process. So we uh, following this we actually discussed about different performance factors of uh, different sensors and uh, some of them being sensitivity, selectivity, working lifetime, etc. If you may just remember that. And then we at length talked about what uh, are the needs and reasons really for miniaturizing these sensors into small platforms. Uh, uh, some of them being the reduced use of reagent uh, volumes which we use for detection, a uh, better thermal control on the devices especially in uh, biological micro reactors. Uh, sometimes control uh, you know because of very less volume uh, on the diffusional processes which results in rapid mixing etc. Um, uh, when you have these thermal uh, cycling action taking place so on so forth. So then we discussed some novel tools of nanobiology uh, where nanobiology is essentially uh, the area where we really study about single cell behavior in terms of processes like translation and transcription and uh, signaling between different cells so on so forth. Today we are going to look at uh, more into the microsystems uh, uh, engineering and uh, we are going to explore some of the materials that are used for designing these biochips or biomems kind of platforms. Uh, we are also going to talk about uh, some of the fabrication processes which are related to uh, realizing these architectures um, uh, essentially as a, a fallout of the silicon industry. Um, uh, it can be directly translated on to making features which are small in the micro domain etc. Uh, we are also going to look into some of the alternative uh, techniques using polymers uh, which are available uh, where we can do uh, in a very easy and uh, inexpensive manner fabrication of such micro devices. So if you look at some of the materials uh, which are used for biochips or biomems uh, device fabrication. We start with the first material that is uh, silicon and uh, essentially all the processes which are borrowed from microelectronics. The other uh, important material that is being used off and on is glass and quartz and one of the reasons why that is so is that because we are talking about uh, transduction processes and sometimes uh, transduction means chemical to optical signal transduction therefore uh, essentially a transparent medium. Uh, like glass or quartz is uh, very much required for covering these devices typically and therefore uh, glass and quartz forms an important material for fabrication of some of these biochips. Alternate materials like polymers we have been talking this off and on that because we are uh, talking about biological entities or biological systems they tend to be very happy in fluidic uh, uh, environment and also while in the presence of carbonaceous materials and polymers being carbon rich materials the emphasis of these biomems devices are slowly shifting from silicon based processes into polymer based processes. One of the other important aspects of polymer is their ease and uh, uh, inexpensiveness of fabrication. Some of the important polymers that we use off and on for such techniques are this wonderful uh, silicone rubber called polydimethylsiloxane PDMS which we use for um, uh, which we use for a process called replication and molding which I will be talking in the next few slides. Uh, PMMA polymethyl methacrylate which is also an e-beam resist uh, is very often used for realizing <coughs> some of these small features and structures. Uh, and then uh, there is Teflon essentially which is a very very highly hydrophobic substance. Uh, if you put a droplet of water onto a Teflon surface, a normal Teflon surface, the contact angle that the droplet has is in the range of about uh, 180, 120 degrees and uh, it shows about how hydrophobic, how super hydrophobic the Teflon surface is. So these are sometimes used especially for optical applications sometimes, Teflon's refractive index being uh, lesser than water or lower than water can use uh, very well into micro, micro architectures uh, to form optical waveguides. So uh, these are some of the alternate routes that biomems uh, or biochip uh, chips are fabricated with. 
and then there is a, this whole new area of trying to realize devices using biological entities themselves and this is really some of uh, one of the novel frontiers in the area of biomems and most of the research which is done now mostly is how to realize devices using moieties like cells, proteins, DNA, so on and so forth. And essentially uh, the whole idea is that <laughs> these uh, biological entities tend to behave well in the presence of uh, other biological entities like cells, proteins, DNA, so on and so forth. So uh, we have this concept of making filters using uh, one or more uh, Y-shaped DNA molecules where you could probably someday be able to actually do a molecule by molecule filtering. So there are several interesting and novel concepts in this particular area. So let us look into some of the fabrication aspects and we start with what silicon has to offer as uh, a fallout of the microelectronic industry. So really this, uh, this topic is all about the formation of structures that could be used to form uh, sensors and actuators using um, some of the conventional silicon processing techniques uh, like uh, etching, deposition, photolithography, oxidation, epitaxy, so on and so forth. And uh, the purpose of these uh, are to make uh, some kind of a processing of uh, either electrical or non-electrical signal uh, generated by some effect which is a result of the sensing activity. And uh, essentially uh, uh, there are some other techniques particularly used for MEMS applications or microfabrication applications and uh, these two techniques form a very important aspect. Uh, one is thick plating where you uh, can make probably more than a micron size film by electro plating onto a surface or deep RI or deep reactive ion etching where you can use a plasma to chemically etch uh, silicon surfaces. So uh, as I have been talking about before, uh, if you really classify this uh, whole area of micro machining, you could actually categorize them into bulk and surface micro machining and uh, this figure here on the left really shows uh, what bulk machining would look like and uh, this again is surface machining. So if you look at this figure, uh, bulk machining is all about trying to take away or subtractively remove material from the bulk or the volume of the material. So this essentially as you see here is a silicon, is a cross sectional view of the silicon wafer and uh, this uh, red layer here as you see on the top is uh, essentially a protective uh, sacrificial layer which is used for preventing the etchant solution uh, or the etchant mechanism to go uh, into certain selected areas over the wafer. Where this uh, mask, we call it a mask, a hard mask, where this mask is absent or removed, uh, you have this etching effect due to which material is removed. Like if you see uh, in this particular zone, uh, let us say in this particular zone, this area has been formulated. Uh, by a cratering effect wherein an etchant has gone in and removed the material uh, through this red mask on the top of it. So this is what wet etching typically does and if you look at it closely uh, you would find out that uh, there is always an undercut in such an etching process wherein the uh, irrespective of how thick the masking material is there is always a tendency of the material to get removed. Uh, from underneath the mask to a reasonable extent. So the idea is that you have to design the mask uh, while designing such kind of etching techniques using uh, or keeping this at the back of your mind. So the mask size has to be typically a little lesser than the size that you would like to etch away uh, in the silicon material. This is another very interesting example of uh, a high aspect ratio etching wherein uh, gas plasmas um, like uh, gases like fl fluorine and chlorine are used to rapidly take away silicon atoms uh, from the surface using this masking layer again. The advantage in that kind of a mechanism is that if you look at the aspect ratio here, these processes can really make high aspect ratio features and structures. So, and uh, typically with straight edges, that is another advantage. And so there are applications where you need such kind of high aspect ratio structures in MEMS where you can use RIE based etching. This again is a very uh, fine example and uh, this is essentially a thin diaphragm which has been realized by 
using a, a P plus silicon which is achieved by doping of uh, normal silicon. And so essentially <coughs> you are having a two sided process where on the, on the front side you use some etching action to remove this sacrificial layer and on the bottom side you use uh, uh, first to remove the layer and then eat away uh, the silicon material so that you can go all the way up to the P double plus where the edge stops typically and uh, you are left with a very thin film or a diaphragm which can be used for a variety of applications. One application could uh, come off and is a pressure transducer. So if you have let us say a piezo material deposited somehow on the top of this thin membrane and you are having this as a part of a circuit where there is a pressure from this end there is always a vibration uh, there is always a bending of the diaphragm due to which there is a signal and from that you could calibrate the ambient pressure available from the closed end of the circuit like this. So these are some of the illustrations where you can see how bulk micro machining is being done. Surface micro machining on the other hand is a is an additive process typically where you are actually building material on the surface of, uh, of silicon. So essentially these pillars what you see here are built on a surface of this base wafer this mother wafer and this is essentially what surface micro machining is all about. So another very interesting factor is, is if you see this particular area here you can find out and uh, let me see where the eraser is just give me one minute yeah. So if you uh, see this particular area here you find out that it has been nicely carved on the inside of a polysilicon film. So this is actually essentially a polysilicon uh, uh, small layer uh, and you use a sacrificial resist layer here. You spin coat this resist and uh, in, a, in a manner that part of the resist stays over and then use uh, deposition technology to deposit a thin film of polysilicon and later on remove the sacrificial material away to realize this small embedded micro channel kind of feature. However, this is also a surface micro machining process because you are considering uh, a thin film uh, which is able to surround a small cavity within itself and thus realizing a small covered micro channel. So there are several uh, important applications of microfabrication processes. This uh, slide has been borrowed from a uh, textbook written by Professor Mark Madhu. Uh, which talks about how the various uh, processes can be integrated together to realize things like diaphragms which we have already seen. So this is a P double plus uh, uh, a thin membrane and you are etching it from the back side uh, so that uh, the material that you use is essentially an etch stop on P double plus so that it does not go ahead and so you are left with a very thin film here. So uh, similarly if you, if you try to build a micro cantilever the process to do it is that you build a sacrificial layer here as you see and then deposit something like an active layer which has a high strength uh, a material which is typically having high strength. And then the idea is that when you take away the sacrificial layer you are left with this thin cantilever on the surface of the silicon. So some of these schemes uh, do help us in realizing structures and features uh, which are very very useful. Uh, as we will see later uh, in many applications for detection and sensing. Now this diagram that we have been illustrating is also known as uh, um, a fabrication schematic and or a, a, a fabrication flow chart and typically all the processing uh, is planned uh, and at the outset such a flow chart is made to give a sequence of processes which would go into realize uh, the microscopic feature that we are considering. So edge selectivity. This is a very important aspect again in fabrication. Uh, essentially, it is uh, uh, the way that an etchant behaves with respect to a surface over which it is etching. And uh, essentially, high etch selectivity is a process or, or is, is a property wherein the etchant that we are using would be able to etch up to the extent that we want to etch on the silicon. To illustrate it a little uh, better, if you see at this, if you look at this. Uh, particular figure here. So essentially you have a sacrificial layer as you can see on both sides here and uh, also covering the silicon wafer the base silicon wafer from the top and uh, this is an illustration of low edge selectivity. So essentially when you are using an agent which slightly eats away the material on the sides and also 
is not um, you know and also on, on this essentially is an etch stop ok. So, this is an etch stop layer that means the etching should stop up to here. But then if you are if you look at this profile which has been generated the etching goes all the way through and it really does not stop at the at the instance that it is supposed to stop. So, this uh, etchant this particular etchant has a low etch selectivity on the substrate. So, it uh, causes typically uh, phenomena like substrate damage and um, uh, you know it basically uh, because of the improper etch stop sometimes realizes features and sizes in a manner that we do not expect them to realize. So, the process has a lot of non uniformities because of an incomplete or because of an improper uh, etching or because of a low edge selectivity ok. So, so essentially uh, high edge selectivity is a necessary characteristic for silicon micro machining and uh, the higher that selectivity is the, the more it prevents erosion of photo resist or underlying films and permits over etching to compensate for process non uniformity. This on the other hand if you look at the figure here on the down here is a process which signifies high edge selectivity ok. So, if you look at this uh, process you can find out very easily and probably can differentiate between you know the it is its counterpart which I have just illustrated on the top here. You see the profile uh, which is generated after the etching the post etching profile here and the post etching profile here and you find out that because of the high edge selectivity the surface is a little better or a little more uniform than the non uniformities which you observe in the low edge selectivity case. So, essentially if a process has a high edge selectivity then it has little substrate damage and uh, there is a proper edge stop layer and essentially things are in your control ok. So, you can do uh, what you really want to do on uh, in terms of etching away or removing material. So, that is what edge selectivity is. So, when we talk about some of the common isotropic uh, wet etching uh, etchants in silicon uh, we always talk in reference to what is the material that is used to etch, what is the particular etchant and what is it selective to ok. So, essentially if you are talking about the material silicon uh, it can be very well etched by these four different uh, etching agents hydrofluoric acid. HNO3 ok and uh, CH3 COH and uh, so essentially these etchants are uh, used for etching over silicon, but it is very selective to SiO2. So, therefore, SiO2 layer or silicon dioxide layer can be used as an etch stop in these situations. Similarly, if you talk about KOH uh, potassium hydroxide it can selectively etch away silicon, but at, at the cost of SiO2, uh, but it is prevented uh, or the etching process stops when once it meets SiO2. Uh, there are other uh, etchants which are illustrated in this particular table and you can probably go through NH4 HF uh, used for etching SiO2, but it is selective to SI. So, is the immediately it uh, encounters an SI layer the etching process stops so on so forth. So, what is interesting here is there is also such etchants uh, which are used uh, for metals on these uh, uh, silicon or other substrates and one reason why metals are used as uh, probably everybody knows is to develop interconnects between the different part of the circuitry that is uh, being put on such a such a wafer. So, therefore, there has to be some etchants for metals as well which can make them to the shape and size uh, desirable to form the conduits or the electrical connectivity between two or more components on the wafer. So, uh, if you talk about aluminum phosphoric acid H3PO4 HNO3 and water this combination acts as a very good agent agent, but it is selective to again SiO2 that means the moment it uh, encounters the SiO2 the H automatically stops and this can be a very good masking layer sacrificial masking layer when you want to selectively etch aluminum away deposited on the surface. So, and these are some basic processes and uh, we will be looking into a lot more details uh, once we come to the actual fabrication uh, part of the lectures. Uh, how uh, what I would like to illustrate now is uh, some of the applications and devices that we often on use in silicon MEMS and uh, these examples uh, have uh, been borrowed off and on from uh, industrial or commercial use and uh, you will probably be able to gauge what uh, utility MEMS has in common day to day life. Uh, so, this figure here if you look at 
is actually a, a bulk micro machine accelerometer and uh, this figure has been borrowed from silicon microstructures. Um, so essentially in this particular device uh, the basic operating principle is schematically explained in this particular region. If you see here there is a vibrating proof mass which means that this mass is essentially on the top of a pivotal um, kind of structure microstructure and it is able to vibrate. So as if there is a hanging mass with a point support from the bottom and it is able to vibrate like this. So it has several degrees of freedom it can probably you know uh, vibrate in let us say this alpha direction on a perpendicular beta direction and then it also can turn and twist like this. So this is a wonderful structure because such structures can be used uh, uh, to gauge very precisely or very accurately the change in acceleration roll, pitch, yaw and these different physical processes. So what essentially happens here is if you look into this particular uh, you know setup here. So these two as you are illustrated here by the, the marks that I am making are a, a part of uh, the proof mass. So they are like wings coming out of the proof mass. So this is the proof mass and there are these small wings on all four sides. And uh, these uh, other structures which are in between here, these other four structures which are in between here are really on the base of the silicon wafer. So they are not uh, really moving. So the wings which are along the proof mass as the proof mass oscillates and moves also move along with the mass. And uh, what happens as a result is that there is a change in capacitance uh, between you know the the wings and this portion of uh, the device because of continuous change in distance and interfacial area. If you all recall uh, your physics uh, days the capacitance can also be written as k epsilon 0 a by d right where a is the interfacial area of a parallel plate capacitor d is the distance between them okay and k epsilon 0 is nothing but the dielectric permittivity of the medium. Uh, if you are putting a dielectric material in between here then it is uh, actually it signifies um, uh, a greater than unity value for k and uh, E0 essentially is the permittivity of free space okay. So as the area between these three structures the interfacial area changes because of this vibration of the wings with respect to the static structure okay and uh, the distance also increases or decreases there is a change in capacitance and we can actually correlate that change in capacitance to things like let us say acceleration or roll or pitch yaw and so therefore this uh, this this whole accelerometer um, uh, this this whole concept can be used to very sensitively detect acceleration. The advantage here is that because of a very uh, small amount of proof mass that we are actually considering uh, even smallest amount of um, you know change in acceleration or deceleration uh, related to a moving structure can be very easily recorded because of the small amount of mass uh, that is involved. So therefore um, it is a fantastic example of what silicon micro machining can do. This is again a very interesting example which I keep illustrating and this is one of the cornerstones of nanotechnology. Uh, this is the AFM tip okay the atomic force microscope tip the way it moves on a surface or the way that, that, that it is able to gauge a surface is by rastering on the surface with a very small sharp pointed tip here okay. So it is like a cantilever arrangement and uh, there is a small tip here and the tip actually moves over the surface. So this is the surface that uh, we are trying to kind of uh, gauge and so as it moves along uh, there are two modes of operation that it has one is called uh, the, uh, the static mode another is the tapping mode. So in the static mode what happens is that as it rasters along the surface uh, due to the different forces that it encounters between the, the topography on the surface which is uh, rough or smooth it generates a set of vibrations okay. And one of the first uh, principles that were used for detecting these vibrations are by using a mirror on the top of this AFM probe and shining a laser on the top of that mirror. And so the idea is that if uh, the tip moves with an angle of let us say uh, theta 
the light beam here would move with an angle of 2 theta okay. So essentially this used to be a basis of finding out what is the z displacement that this tip would have as it moves along a rough surface and from that you could gauge uh, the average surface roughness. Now of course there is a uh, lot of complicated electronics which goes into to detecting what exactly uh, is the z displacement and essentially the AFM image that you see is really a reconstructed image it is not a hands on a real real image okay. So from all these z displacements pulled together in a software you would be able to gauge what the surface roughness is like as the AFM scans on the surface. There is another mode which is simultaneously used in a lot of applications it is called the tapping mode uh, in which essentially this tip here is having a natural frequency of vibration. So you are basically exciting the tip in that case while it rasters over the surface and the idea is that if it comes too close or too far away from the surface and there is a change in force um, and these forces mind you between the tip and the surface could be due to many reasons. It could be due to Van der Waals forces of interaction between the nucleus on one and the electron on another or it could be some repulsive forces because of the electron electron repulsion so on so forth. So there is a variety of forces uh, which come into play. So as these forces uh, uh, are executed on a vibrating tip there is a change in the fundamental frequency of vibration because of that and from that you could gauge uh, what is the surface roughness which the AFM is trying to measure. So it is one of the most fascinating tools probably that uh, this technology this MEMS technology has given uh, to the field of physical sciences and uh, 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 we all probably know how important the AFM is uh, in terms of uh, uh, gauging very small uh, fine structures at uh, the submicron domain. Uh, another very fascinating example of uh, how silicon MEMS is used in the industry is this uh, digital micrometer device chip from Texas Instruments. Uh, the projector the common laboratory projector uh, because of which uh, uh, essentially uh, I am being filmed and I am able to give this lecture is based on you know the MEMS technology okay. And essentially uh, the idea here is very simple that you have uh, so called a mirror which is pivoted on these two pivots on both sides okay. And this mirror uh, has an electrical imprint on its back side. So we are talking about the small plate here the shiny plate here made up of metal which has an electrical uh, connection on its back side. The base over which these pillars used for pivoting this mirror are resting also has simultaneously electrical connections on its surface. So if you are considering this thin film which is hanging between let us say two pivotal points and there is a surface on the bottom uh, there is essentially an interaction going on between the electrodes placed on the back side of this mirror or this film and uh, the surface of uh, the silicon uh, material okay. And because of this electrical force uh, there is a tendency of the mirror to rotate about the pivot pivotal point. So <laughs> let me just illustrate this a uh, little more clearly here uh, just give me a minute. Uh, so if you look at this uh, particular structure here it is a very fantastic way of uh, rotating the rotation takes place over these two edges here okay and uh, the essentially there is an array of uh, such mirrors and these mirrors are very very tiny let us say about 10 micron into 10 micron or so and it corresponds to what you call a pixel okay. And essentially when there is a uh, there is a light beam which is uh, reflected off this mirror we can actually deviate the light beam into the path of the image or outside the path of the image by just deflecting this mirror. So in one instance maybe the beam which is coming from let us say this particular source goes into one of these mirrors here and the mirror is able to deflect the beam through the lens onto the through the lens onto the screen for the projection okay. In another instance because of this electrical actuation the mirror goes out of view and the light is not passed through the lens in the process. So what we are essentially trying to do is to switch on and off the various pixels okay. So one of these mirrors forms one pixel and there are millions of pixels which makes an image. 
So, if there is a tendency of this mirrors to rotate and out focus some of the pixels would be switched off essentially and so therefore, uh, the image on a computer is in a digital manner transferred to such a such a device a DMD uh, chip form of device where these uh, these light beams are essentially uh, used for switching off and on various pixels on getting signals 1s and zeros, and digitally an image can be transferred from a computer to a to a uh, uh, you know projector ok. So, these are some of the examples of commercially available silicon MEMS. Uh, let us actually look into a little more of what other applications are possible. This is a fascinating example borrowed from analog devices and by the by analog devices is uh, uh, one of the uh, commercial companies uh, which sells a lot of these accelerometer chips. Essentially all the automobiles um, have a mechanism called uh, the, the, there is a mechanism wherein uh, there is uh, there is an accident prevention by actuating um, uh, a balloon ok. Uh, wherever there is a crash uh, there is a there is a safety mechanism in most of these automobiles where there is a um, uh, you know uh, uh, air bag which comes out. We call it uh, the air bag technology, but essentially it is an air balloon ok which comes out and uh, prevents uh, the driver from crashing into the steering ok. And uh, these uh, chips here, these accelerometer chips here are essentially used to control and sense such uh, accelerations. The moment it crosses a certain limit where there is a tendency of this driver to be driven uh, and uh, this happens only when a, a high speed automobile is suddenly brought to uh, rest ok, a huge deceleration is there. And so, in that case it opens a nitrogen bottle and uh, it suddenly just uh, fills the air bag and the air bag comes out uh, in the steering area. So, that uh, a crash is prevented between the driver and the steering wheel ok. So, uh, such devices are very very successful commercially available reputable uh, and, and, and these, uh, these are potential application of MEMS. Another very interesting application is this single chip microphone. The small button mic uh, which I am actually using for speaking today is essentially based on MEMS technology. So, if you look at the, the basic structure of such a mechanism it has a, it has a perforated diaphragm at the microscopic lens scale ok. And uh, there is a piezo material on the top of this diaphragm. So, the idea is that whatever we are speaking ok, what is speech really? or why is it that uh, if I am uh, saying something you are able to hear ok. So, sound wave as you know is a set of compression and rarefaction. So, uh, uh, when this whole you know when we are trying to communicate we are trying to essentially move the air uh, from uh, you know our, our mouth by various movements of our tongue and creating a series of this compression and rarefaction which goes or emanates from my mouth and that waves goes uh, ahead and you are able to get that same sensation and your ear is essentially a transducer which tries to get a signal based on that ok. Now, if you look at the same process uh, in, um, in a silicon microchip, uh, this diaphragm here is a very sensitive uh, uh, you know uh, is, is, is a very thin and very sensitive uh, vibration based mechanism where these compression and rarefactions can be really actuated into electrical signals and that is by means of this piezo layer which is stacked on the top of this, this perforated diaphragm. And so, therefore, uh, whatever we are speaking is converted into uh, electrical signals ok and they are transported uh, long distances essentially and then you know uh, they can be again reconverted back by again a similar kind of diaphragm which uh, produces the inverse effect. That means, the electrical signal is converted back into a uh, mechanical vibration and that is what uh, uh, the speaker essentially does ok the loudspeaker essentially does. So, so that is a very fine example of what again silicon MEMS can do it is a silicon single chip microphone. So, after discussing this uh, I would like to shift my focus a little bit to uh, polymer MEMS ok and especially MEMS with a perspective of biology ok because the area that we are mentioning is bio MEMS or bio chip. So, as I indicated earlier uh, in addition to silicon because of the biocompatibility aspects uh, there is uh, uh, you know huge demand of uh, polymer based uh, you know 
microsystems. Okay. Some of the possible choices that I mentioned before and I am going to reiterate here are polydimethylsiloxane as you can see here in this, hydrogels, okay, uh, very interesting polymer, uh, polymeric systems uh, which are used for uh, making these biomems uh, kind of devices, PMMA, polymethyl methacrylate, Teflon and SU8 is a negative tone photoresist. Uh, in our first lecture, we talked a little bit about what negative tone resist does. Okay, it's basically something which gets exposed to light and gets cross bonded, so it can remain. Uh, so, what are the requirements really for material selection, or what are the material selection criteria for realizing biomems or biochips? So, one aspect, of course, is biocompatibility. Whether the material we are using is an ideal material for the biological entities to keep happy and function in a normal manner. Um, then trans optical transparency again uh, within the visible spectrum is a very important aspect of uh, such uh, such systems. Uh, b basically, you know the materials, the, most of the transduction processes uh, where we convert a chemical signal into an optical signal involves uh, the reading uh, and uh, reading of light. Okay, so optical clarity or transparency is really uh, one of the major issues uh, which we should consider in material selection for. Biomems devices. Rapid fabrication again, how rapidly you could manufacture. Uh, we had to manufacture many of those MEMS devices within a short amount of time. Polymer being expensive, there is a tendency of the industry uh, to make mostly reusable chips and therefore uh, they have to be produced at a great rate okay, to keep up with the pace of diagnostic uh, requirements of the industry. And uh, then, of course, uh, a polymer material or uh, material should be such that it is photo definable. The way that micro features or micro structures are translated are majority uh, are, are done uh, mostly through you know light as a means and so therefore photo definability or ability to be defined by using light or photons um, uh, is, is, is a great criteria which is a very important for selection of materials. Also just because we want to study chemical, chemically active species, the materials that we are using should be chemically modifiable. So therefore, there, uh, the, really we, we, we really do not want materials which are inert in nature. Okay, they should be easily be able to modify, get modified so that we can attach uh, recognition elements uh, using covalent uh, linkage or maybe using cross linking agents and uh, therefore, chemical modifiability again is a very important aspect of um, uh, these devices. So, if you look at uh, these technologies, uh, the immunochip from a Clara technologies again is an example where plastic cartridge is used for doing uh, you know immunological tests. Similarly, uh, this right here is an illustration from caliper technologies, it is a lab on chip platform uh, wherein micro channels and features are used to do a lot of diagnostics. But again, if you look at it as a transparent plastic that is used, several such devices are available commercially. Okay, so uh, once we are actually, uh, uh, once we have the selection criteria well defined, uh, the next question is how especially in case of polymers we can fabricate these devices. So this approach really started with uh, you know Whiteside's group um, way back in about early part of uh, the 90s and these approaches also uh, known as soft lithography. Okay, so essentially there are several processes. Uh, which have come as a result of uh, this basic replication and molding technique which I am going to illustrate in details a little bit uh, later. So, there are various approaches replication and molding, micro contact printing, micro molding in capillaries, micro transfer molding, solvent assisted micro molding, dip and lithography and then there are some other approaches like compression molding uh, which, um, in, which encompasses hot embossing and injection molding and also nano imprint lithography and, uh, and then you have inkjet printing. Okay. So, all uh, a bunch of these processes or a combination of such processes are sometimes very useful for realizing MEMS devices. Uh, so, some illustrations that is uh, reflected here, uh, this is a, a work done by Ivan et al from North Carolina Chapel Hill uh, back in 2007 where he talks about the, the fabrication of structures and features which are uh, about 80 or 90 microns in length and almost uh, 2 to 3 microns in size and they are like uh, cilia. Okay. We have been talking about cilia uh, if you may remember while we were talking about nose as a sensor. Okay. Cilia is essentially a hair like moiety. 
So uh, how we make it? Uh, essentially, we use this material PDMS polydimethylsiloxane and then try to increase the strength by uh, making some nanoparticulate addition uh, to the material. And uh, with this high strength material, we can replicate uh, the material once it is in liquid form and uh, uh, over, over some kind of a dye and then solidify the material and pull off the dye <coughs> to realize the cilia. So the idea here was in this paper that uh, they uh, wanted to use the additive, um, an iron based ferromagnetic additive uh, for trying to uh, move the cilia around with, a, with an external magnet. And the idea was, uh, the idea can be used for uh, providing locomotion okay, of uh, species like of, of the same range as bacteria. Typically bacteria also float around in the solution by uh, these hair like tentacles called cilia sometimes you know which lets it uh, go by uh, with the pedaling action of the cilia. Okay. There. So, now uh, let us talk about the details of uh, these processes one by one. So, replication and molding again and uh, I would like you to focus now more on these, uh, this figure here on the right of the slide. So, the process starts with uh, something called a mold okay? and this mold is essentially made up of uh, silicon wherein by using a variety of processes like maybe etching, wet etching, lithography and wet etching you could realize these small small features on the top of the silicon wafer. Okay? So, these features are <laughs> essentially the mold and uh, as you are all aware probably that mold is something, it is a shape that is used uh, for getting impregnated onto a, surf, uh, a liquid which later on can solidify and take the inverse shape or the negative shape of the mold. So, once this mold is realized uh, and this mold mind you uh, can be made using and these features here that I have been illustrating here can be made using silicon dioxide, silicon nitride, you know metals, photoresists, wax so on so forth and uh, the thickness of this could be really very very small in the micron range. Once this mold is done uh, then uh, you pour uh, this liquid material called PDMS polydimethylsiloxane and uh, let me give you a little more details about what PDMS really is. So, PDMS is actually a silicone rubber okay? and uh, essentially it has two components one is uh, the resin part another is a bonder or a cross, cross binding agent or cross linking agent and uh, we mix these two components in a certain ratio with maybe 10 parts to one part of the resin to the cross bonder or uh, 5 parts to one part and uh, the cross bonder is always of course uh, lower in volume than the basic resin and uh, once the, the property the unique property of this material is that once uh, such a mix uh, after thorough mixing is heated to a temperature of about 80 to 85 degrees Celsius. Uh, for about uh, close to 40-45 minutes, it uh, cross links the polymer matrix and develops a, a, a rubbery kind of membranous structure. Uh, what is also important to know about this material PDMS is uh, that it can actually replicate very high aspect ratio structures. So, suppose you have let us say a, a 25 paisa coin. Okay, and uh, you want to replicate what is there on one side of the coin which is essentially some features coming out you all must have seen. So, if you can replicate uh, this, so you pour the PDMS, heat cure it and then remove this and you will be amazed to see that whatever features are there on this 25 paisa coin are uh, the negative of those features are transferred onto the PDMS surface in toto. Okay. So, it is just verbatim transferred. So, uh, that is the beauty. So, it these PDMS is, is material which goes into all the crevices be it short, narrow, whatever and try to replicate everything very accurately. So, essentially uh, if you look at uh, this slide back again, uh, the PDMS in liquid form is poured over this mold material and of course, there are walls on the side which can prevent the flowing back and so therefore, um, uh, then you heat cure it of course and uh, the PDMS develops a rubbery kind of material in this particular area and uh, then uh, you can use, uh, you can remove this this material, this PDMS from uh, the mold uh, thus the PDMS is left on the surface with a negative of the impression of the mold. Okay. Now, these two uh, steps uh, need a little bit of pre-processing okay, because uh, sometimes it is uh, very important 
especially if the PDMS uh, layer is thin, to keep it in one piece as you are removing. Okay, and therefore uh, we use these agents called mold release agents. Okay, so essentially this master when you fabricate, you ensure that you treat or you 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 pre-treat the surface with an agent like, let's say trimethyl chlorosilane or, or some agent which can prove uh, preferentially do silanization on the surface okay, and make the surface uh, hydrophobic in nature. Okay. So, therefore, uh, the idea is that you put molecules and you put uh, some groups or linkers uh, or, 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 or molecules I would say not linkers on the surface of the mold uh, which uh, is able to um, kind of fight with the, with the PDMS molecules. Okay. So, it kicks it back. So, the only way to do that is to lower both the surface energies so that uh, you can separate or you can have an easier separation. PDMS by the by is a very methyl rich uh, material with a lot of CH3 groups on the surface and if you look at the contact angle of uh, PDMS uh, material it is about 108 degrees or so. So, you get the inverted replica of what you want uh, uh, to you know uh, develop as a mold and uh, therefore, um, the mold is planned in a manner which is exactly the negative of what you want as features or impressions onto the PDMS surface. Mold of course, can be defined uh, by photolithographic means where you prepare a CAD file, expose a wafer, use a sacrificial layer, do etching or some other processing mechanism and then uh, the mold is realized. Okay. So, some uh, issues with this processes is that you uh, really cannot uh, go using normal PDMS over a certain aspect ratio because if you look at these two typically you know processes or these two products in this case there are these long standing you know arms of the PDMS material and if if they are just hanging by themselves there is a tendency to kind of uh, you know kind of adhere to each other. Uh, one a property of PDMS is that it makes fine reversible bonds with any surface that is near about it. So, if you put it on, um, on, on a glass surface or a silicon surface, it, it results almost immediately in a reversible seal. Okay. Uh, so, that is a beauty of this particular uh, material. It being soft, it can confirm to the surface of interest very accurately. And so, typically remove all air which comes in between while this reversible adhesion is going on very quickly. This is another, uh, this is another pitfall that uh, if you want to develop uh, uh, the PDMS uh, in the form of a chamber and then you uh, bond uh, that upper layer of PDMS with a flat surface, uh, you have to be careful about the aspect ratio here because if it is too high then this kind of a problem may happen and because of the weight the PDMS may sag down like this and adhere to the surface and you are left with a uh, blocked uh, you know reaction chamber essentially or a blocked chamber essentially. So, the, the process steps again uh, highlighted here. So, you start with uh, the master mold made up of silicon glass metal SU8 so on so forth. You surface uh, treat the master by using a salinization protocol where you put some groups which kind of repel uh, the PDMS material. Okay. Uh, you mix uh, the oligomer and the curing agent and then uh, prepare or uh, the PDMS and pour the PDMS on the top of this cured or, or silanized mold and then essentially you heat it from 60 to 80 degrees uh, for about 1 hour or so and then peel off the PDMS so that whatever features are there on the surface of the mold get replicated and then another advantage of this process is that the mold really can be reused again and again. So, uh, you know that is why it is uh, extremely rapid also. So, uh, you know it is identical to saying that one mold can be used 20 times or 30 times. So, you do not have to make the mold again and again and you can just keep on uh, pouring, curing, peeling off and then again reusing it. So, of course, it is a, a very economical and a very rapid process. So, the process was developed by Whitesides group again uh, back in nine, way back in you know 1998 when he reported that this kind of techniques can be used for micro devices fabrication. The next uh, process that I would like to uh, illustrate is this micro contact printing and it is again a very important uh, process for the bio biological industry. So, in this process what you do and if I would like uh, to seek your attention here to uh, the figure. So, you would start with again a PDMS stamp okay, 
So this is, uh, if you look at a PDMS stamp, which is uh, developed by probably a replication or molding kind of technique. And uh, here uh, you can, uh, the, the basic purpose of micro contact printing is to put molecules selectively over surfaces like gold maybe, okay, or platinum. So, the whole idea is that you start with a PDMS replica and then you coat this PDMS replica as you are seeing this region here with some kind of a molecule which you would like to transfer. Now, there can be several kind of things that you could do for this transferring. You could actually transfer alkyl thiols, you could uh, transfer thiolated DNA or thiolated proteins uh, onto the surface. So, essentially something, the molecule which has a feature uh, wherein there is an adsorption of uh, a part or a group of the molecule over uh, the surface in question. Okay. And then you have this, uh, this silicon surface which is coated with a thin film as you are seeing here on the top uh, of gold and titanium. Okay. So, essentially what you are talking here is uh, that uh, the, you know, uh, the titanium is used as an adhesion layer for the gold. Okay. So, you have a small film of titanium on the top of the silicon all through and let me just try to draw it here probably in this region. Okay. And then beyond that you have another thin film this black film of gold. Okay. And so, there is a, a very highly stabilized structure. And so, what you do is uh, this micro contact printing is essentially a stamping process. Okay. Uh, so, what happens in a rubber stamp? So, you take uh, the stamp right, and you put it on an ink pad and you press it on an ink pad so that the ink gets transferred onto the stamp surface and then you take that stamp over uh, on a piece of paper and then put that stamp and wait for the paper to absorb the ink from the stamp surface by capillary effects. Okay. Once it is done, you remove the stamp and you find out that whatever was there on the stamp, uh, the negative of it has been uh, printed onto the paper. Okay. So, this is an identical process. So, here instead of the paper, you are using a gold film on the surface and instead of the ink, you are transferring thiolated molecules. So, uh, probably some of you are aware that you know uh, a molecule with a thiol group that means SH adsorbs very well on gold surfaces. Okay. So, here we take the molecule and uh, we press the stamp against the gold and wait for the whole you know the reaction kinetics, uh, the reaction of adsorption to happen fully and uh, there is a certain time constant with which it happens and we wait for that time and then pull off uh, the stamp. So, that we the, the molecules which were there on the stamp get transferred onto the gold surface as small heaps. Now, uh, there, is a, there is an immense amount of use of this process, especially when you are talking about hybridization arrays, where there is a requirement of putting, you know, uh, making a realizing a library of uh, different capture probes uh, for uh, capturing different target DNA molecules. We need, uh, in a sense, a surface on which we can put these small heaps of molecules of certain types. Okay. And then uh, we also should be able to know what is there on which column or which row of this matrix or array of molecules that we have created. Okay. So, micro contact printing essentially is a very important process for those kind of application. In sensory uh, science, sensory technologies, micro contact printing is used off and on for uh, such applications. And uh, you could use this process for etching away uh, or depositing. And uh, etching away means that you have uh, a layer of these molecules already deposited, pre-deposited on the top of uh, a gold surface from which you are probably taking a gold coated stamp and then putting it on and taking away some of the molecules. Okay. So, that is etching and deposition is the reverse where you are actually leaving the molecules onto the surface. So, there have been some intelligent designs so far of or modifications of this process wherein a high throughput 
uh, formulation of this uh, molecule laying out on the surface is realized. This is one instance where there is this uh, roller mechanism which actually picks up the molecules from some source probably and then it delivers rapidly onto a surface which also moves in, uh, in a direction conducive to the direction of rotation. Similarly, there is this mechanism again where you can see that the molecules are being transferred from the PDMS stamp onto this PDMS by a, uh, you know, a, by a central cylinder which uh, essentially picks up the molecule and places the molecule on this particular upper PDMS structure. So, in a nutshell the following steps are involved in micro contact printing. You ink the PDMS surface with molecules, alkyl thiols, proteins, DNA, transfer the layer through the physical contact in, uh, in a gold layer and optimize the time so that there is a good amount of uh, time for the adsorption to fully take place. And then of course, uh, the inking is performed because of that via covalent binding of the substrate on the substrate or physisorption on the substrate and uh, it can be performed on flat as well as curved surfaces. So, this is another important soft lithography process into question. The, the other process which is very important uh, and uh, sometimes used in display technologies is capillary molding. Okay. And uh, essentially the concept is again similar that uh, you essentially, so um, essentially uh, the next process that we will be talking about uh, is capillary molding used for micro patterning and probably this and subsequently some other soft lithography techniques uh, we will cover in the next lecture.